Father, we thank you because when the wind blows, the eagles that we are will rise above the odds. Lord, we give you praise. Father, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. I just want us to take one step further in the atmosphere of his presence and go ahead and just break bread together. And so, if we can just get a host, let my brother Lawrence to just give up the, um, the elements for the community. on the way to Emmaus. They walked for about seven miles with the resurrected Savior and did not know that it was him until he broke bread. And the Bible says that the moment that he broke bread and gave to them, their eyes were open and they saw him. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus that they saw was the fullness of the salvation that God gave to man. However, they were still puzzled. They were still with questions. They were, they were still like sheep without a shepherd until Jesus broke bread and gave to them. And there were several of us who might be there wherein we are still a little perturbed, a little confused. We still suffer a little bit of anxiety because we can't, we have yet to see the fullness of what God has done for us. And so in this moment, I pray that as we break bread, as we receive his blood and his body, our eyes will be open to see what he has for us. Because the moment you see what he has for you, then you know exactly where to put your feet. The moment you see what it has for you, you know exactly how wide you need to open your arms to embrace that grace. So why don't we just go ahead right now and step into that privilege. This is the body of Jesus. This is the body of Jesus. Now, if you're new to what we're doing here, I want you to know that we're not just about to eat a little slice of bread, which this barely qualifies for. And we're not about to have a sip of some juice. We're about to partake of the Lord's body and of his blood. He said it himself. He says, if you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and if you don't drink his blood, you have no part in him. Now, if he did it one time and and that was it. Then we wouldn't have any business doing it again. But he did it. And they did it again and again. Multiple times the resurrected Savior broke bread. And on one of those occasions he said as often as you have the opportunity. Do this in remembrance of me. So I want you to take hold of that privilege. And say no to blindness. And say no 
to confusion because now you see clearly. So folks, let us get right into it. This is the body of Jesus. That was broken for me. And as I eat of it today, I call to remembrance the forces that govern life. I say to them, it was for me that Jesus died. Those stripes that were laid on his back were there for my healing. So I speak health. I speak wholeness over my life as Jesus paid for to the tune that Jesus paid for to the measure that Jesus paid for which is completeness which is wholeness that is what I speak over me in the mighty name of Jesus you may eat the Lord's body we have held to the measure of his sacrifice and he made a complete sacrifice Jesus made that sacrifice that is the one and for all sacrifice this is the blood of Jesus that was shed for me this is that life that he poured out that I may live the glorified life a life of peace with nothing missing with nothing broken I do this Jesus in remembrance of you in remembrance of your sacrifice I call my own mind to remembrance I call my own mind to remembrance and I say to my mind I say to my heart, fear not, for Jesus is with you. I call to remembrance, I call to remembrance, hell below. And I say, this life which I live is the life of Jesus that he gave up. And so as I drink the blood today, to remembrance of the privilege that I have in him. The life that overcame the world. You may drink the blood in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just for a very brief moment, With every head bowed in reverence of his presence. Folks, I want you to say something to him. Tell him that you love him too. You see, we love him for he first loved us. So why don't you just tell him, I love you too. And you know, we're always asking for this and that. Why don't you take a moment and say thank you for all that you have done. I am thankful. I am grateful. Father, we give you praise. Lord, let our eyes be open to see your kingdom come. In the mighty name of Jesus. Why don't you give him a big hand of praise. Thank Him, bless Him, magnify Him. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Now, folks, if you think that that worship was phenomenal, why don't we just give these guys a round of applause and just celebrate these guys? Wow, that was amazing. Thank you, guys. God is good. Now, we're going to continue the service in a quick moment, but what I would love for you to do is, as the lights come on, I want you to find someone whose name you don't know, 
and introduce yourself to them. And while returning to your seat, I want you to find a seat closer to the front so that we can be closer to the action. Can we do that? So guys, I want you to find somebody and say hello to them, introduce yourself, tell them your name. If you don't have a name, make one up as you're going. Come on, we're not, we're not moving enough. Let's move, let's move around. Let us move around. Awesome. Alrighty. Please let's see if we can find our seats now. If we can go back to our seats, that will be awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Folks, can I just, if you don't mind at all, and I don't like to trouble people with this, but I guess I may have to do this today. If we can move a little closer to the front, and I'm not going to point at anybody, but if you're sitting and there's nobody behind you, I want you to move forward. Let's just do that. Let's see if we can move forward. Oh, yeah. If there's nobody behind you, I wasn't going to call anybody, but I'm going to call. I'm going to call somebody. Oh, yeah. I can't see him too clearly from here. This is my old glasses. Hey, look at that. Brother Jacques, that's you. Your smile gave you away. Can you move forward, please? <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on. All righty, God is good. Oh, yeah, I just want to say, you know what, why don't you raise your right hand, everybody, if you can, if you can just raise your right hand and see if you can miraculously sweep that across to the other side of your back and just pat yourself on the shoulder. Well done for coming out on a Sunday night. Oh, yeah, it takes, it takes really loving Jesus to come out on a Sunday night. You know, you have all of that Monday morning to worry about. And I tell you what, you can watch out for this. When other people need coffee to get up tomorrow, I don't think you will. You see, because there's going to be a special release of grace here tonight. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God is good. Now, once again, I just want to recognize, before we go ahead, my dear friend, um, Jeff Chandler. What a man of God you are. What a blessing you are. That was phenomenal. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. And um, I want to honor you, but at the same time, I want to tell on you because now my voice is usually louder than this. But in that worship, I was trying to keep up with you and Steve-O. And right now, I have just been called to repentance not to do that again. You know, I was trying to scream and shout, and I lost my voice in the process. And in the middle of that, this man came along, and he was singing. And I was like, I'm not even going to try to keep up with him. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Nice to see you. I believe it's your first time here. Good to have you here. Now, if there's anybody here that is, anybody else that is here for the first time at Altitude, um, whether on a Saturday night on a, or a Sunday night like this, can I just see your hand up? We want to recognize you. Well, God bless you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you for coming out. Awesome. Awesome. And I just want to say thank you to the guys who invited them because I believe everyone who's here for the first time today was personally invited by somebody which is amazing. Um, so can you do me a favor in the seat pocket in front of you, there is a card. 
we call that the connect card. Yours is already in your hand. If you can just fill that out nicely, uh, one of the reasons why we encourage that is because we want to be able to keep in touch with you. Uh, we're a prophetic ministry, and we believe very much that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is what we live by. And so when we preach and teach and prophesy, we record every single thing, and we want to be able to share that with you. So just if you can provide us your name, your email, and your telephone number as well, that will be greatly appreciated. I guarantee you, if you want to test whether we sell information here, just ask the person next to you who their insurance company is. And I guarantee you it's most likely going to be different from yours. And that means we don't sell your information to people that market to you. If you haven't noticed, there are places where you go to, almost everybody after like six months, they use the same insurance provider. And that's why because the information gets shared with people. Uh, we, we're not spiting them, but we're just saying that we don't do that here. So feel free to share your information with us. Now, I'm going to do something that I've not done in a long time, but I just want to do it today uh, because it's important. If you've not been getting text messages or emails from us, and I see your hand. All righty. Brother Terry, you need to take one of those cards and fill it out now because that means we don't have your information. Okay, thank you. So you take, take it out and, and fill it because, I mean, the kind of things that we send out in our emails, you just never know when a word like that will bring a spark to your situation. You just never know. I mean, we have Will Holiday all the way from Scotland and is still sending those emails every week, twice a week. And he doesn't send them by himself. There are times where he'll ask me to chime in on it. Dr. Danny chimes in on it. And, you know, we, we, ha we have all of that concerted effort to send a message out. And we send it out not just to remind you of the meetings, but also to bless you with a word from the heart of God. And so thank you, folks, um, for doing that. One more thing before I bring up uh, Leke and Sedani to come and minister to us. At the beginning of the service, while we were having the pre-service prayer, uh, just before I came into the pre-service prayer, the Lord gave me this word. And that there is grace in here for growth. There is grace for grace to grow. Yes. And so I want to encourage you, if there's any area of your life wherein you struggle to overcome limitations, you struggle to overcome the hurts of the past and some bad behavior. You know, the Bible says in the heart of a little child, foolishness is bound. If there are some things that I've sustained from your childhood or from being a baby believer that is not letting you move on and be fruitful, there is grace in here today to overcome. And so I want to encourage you to reach out by faith to touch the hem of his garment. And that grace will bless you. You don't have to leave that grace behind today. And so very quickly, um, I want you to search within yourself. And see where you can apply that grace. Because I know that when a word like that comes forth. If we can just attach faith to that word. It takes care of everything else. Alrighty. So be encouraged. And now with great joy. I want to welcome off stage. My dear friends. For a time of ministration. In such a very creative way. Ladies and gentlemen. Leke and Sedani. I can't believe they did this. I got through college and finally landed my dream job as an architect for the Solomon firm. I showed up early and ready to work every day for 12 years straight without one client complaint. I knew I was going to make partners. One day, the boss called me up to his office. I said to myself, this is it, I'm gonna make partners. I could already picture how I was gonna decorate that top corner office with my name on the door and my degrees on the wall. I was gonna put a picture of my wife and kids next to my old college baseball trophy. 
On my way to the office, I saw Mark from Project Management, and he gave me the strangest smirk. As I got closer to the office, I felt butterflies in my stomach. Listen, there's no use. The pastor already prayed for me like a million times, laid hands, used extra virgin olive oil, white sheets, the works. <laughs> But I'm still here in this empty home because of what she made me do. I was the fastest girl in track and field. 100 meter sprint at 13.02 seconds. No one can top me. Well, no one that is except for Jose. He was the love of my life until mom found out. She forbid me to date him, saying that all he wanted was one thing, and that one thing guaranteed me to forfeit my scholarship to Howard University. Well, their dreams of me becoming fourth generation alumni went down the drain the morning mom found me in the upstairs bathroom. Mr. Shapiro waited for me to come inside. I took a seat. Right away, he started commending me on all the great work that I've been doing and I was smiling from ear to ear. He said he wanted my opinion, so I started telling him about the people I thought could take my old position. He cut me off and said, no, you misunderstand. I want your opinion on Mark becoming partner. You want my opinion on Mark becoming partner? There's no way he should be partner before me. He's still wet behind the ears. He has a snotty nose. He's not even an architect. This always happens. I remember in college, I was on track to be in the MLB until I hurt my shoulder. And now this, another disappointment. This life of frustration, I can't take it. Tonight I think I'm gonna go home and She thought it was food poisoning, but I knew, I knew it was Jose's baby growing inside of me. Mom held my hand at the doctor's office, constantly checking my forehead for a fever. When the nurse came in confirming that I was six weeks pregnant, mom went off. She yelled at the nurse and then she slapped me. The next morning she called Planned Parenthood and by the following week, Following week, the love that was growing inside of me was removed, leaving me in pain and regret. It's been 11 years, 11 years of Thanksgivings and 11 Christmases where it's just me and Jose eating alone. No kids to celebrate with opening up presents because of what she made me do. Oh yeah, and if you're wondering, I did graduate Howard University, but I don't have a career to show for it. A bitter heart can't hold down a nine to five. All right, so I know that was kind of depressing, but we're gonna speak life to our characters. We're gonna to minister to them, and we're gonna we're gonna speak life back to them. So I don't know if Lake, if you want to start first. My character was a middle-aged man who faced rejection and disappointment every time he thought he was on his way up in life. A door would shut in his face, so he was facing, um, you know, hope deferred. Um, so yeah, that's the character. So um, if you had one scripture to minister to your character, what would you pick? The scripture I had for him would be um, Psalms 30, verse 5. And in that, and in that um, 
verse it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a good scripture. So my character was pretty much groomed to be the fastest girl in track and field, but she fell in love at 15, and her mom forced her to have her abortion. So she was left with bitterness, regret, pain, um, unforgiveness, a lot of things inside of her. She was just, she couldn't even hold down a nine to five. She couldn't even hold down a job because she had that much unforgiveness resting inside of her all those years. So um, I think with my character, she really needs to be able to forgive. So I will pick Mark eleven twenty five, and I'm just paraphrasing, and it says that if you're standing in prayer and you have a trespass against someone, forgive them so your Father in Heaven can forgive you. And that is very important because as you see in the beginning of the um, monologue, that my character had gotten prayer. She had the works, the olive oil, and all of that. But why wasn't she getting healed? Maybe because there was unforgiveness in her that was scarring her, preventing that blockage of her being able to get healing. So it's very important to, you know, go go in and have that forgiveness. I know Lake he shared, like, a pretty good story the other day with me about a story that he heard about Jesus. Um, yeah, it had to do with the passage of that Jesus says, behold, I, I knock on the door, uh, or I, I wait and I knock on the door, and the door is symbolizing our hearts. And a lot of us, we tend to let Jesus in, but we want to keep him in the living room where it's nice and clean. We don't want to let him into the back room where, you know, there's dirty clothes and dirty laundry. We don't want to let him into the bathroom where there's a ring around the toilet or the bathtub and or the kitchen with the dirty dishes still in there. We just want to keep them in the spot, not knowing that Jesus is the one that comes to clean, uh, cleanse us and clean us of all the problems that we have mm-hmm. within us. Um, so yeah, I, I was really touched when I heard that and I just wanted to share that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of this um, time in our marriage. We just had gotten married and this is a real story. We just got married, and probably just months in, and we were sleeping, and I had a dream. And in the dream, I was laying on this hospital slab, and I looked over in this room, and Lake was laying on a slab, and he was looking back over at me. And this really, really tall guy, he had a hospital mask on, and he had a, a gown on, and he hovered over me, and he took a really, really long probe, and he stuck it deep down in my thigh. And I remember at that same time, I just was like, whoop, and I woke up. And simultaneously, Lake, laying next to me now in this reality, is holding his side and moaning. I I wasn't moaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was was a moan. I think it was probably more like a groan, a groan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, at that time, I think I was, I was having a dream also, and I was driving the car, and there was a person in my passenger seat, and the man, he reached his hand into my side, and he just held on to my kidney. He held on to one of my kidneys, and I was like struggling with him while trying to drive the car, and you know, I was rebuking him and calling the name of Jesus, and nothing I was doing was working, so I, I, I mean, I woke up, I didn't say anything about it because I thought it was a bad dream. So. Yeah, and I, I just went to work. I woke up, I went to work, I was like, I'm not going to talk about what happened last night, whatever. And, you know, when I got to work, I just couldn't let the dream go. It just kept coming up, kept coming up. Like, how me and him going to wake up, you know, doing all of that? So I asked God, I said, what does this dream mean? And he led me to Psalm 26.2, and it says, examine me, prove me, Try my reins and my heart. And I started thinking out of that whole verse, you're like, what, what in the world does reins mean? So I'm doing some more research on the word reins. Reins from the Hebrew and the old Latin means kidneys or loins. So now if you know your anatomy, the kidney is the most deeper, innermost part of the body. It's the organ, little two organs, and that's the innermost organ that we have. So doing some more research, um, the actual... Um, I believe old ancient um, saying was that the kidneys was the seat of our emotions, our affections, 
and our thoughts. And then even another saying goes even further to say that the innermost component of our mind. So seeing all of that, I started thinking like, oh man, I'm starting to get what the dream was about. After that dream, all hell broke loose in our marriage, and it was crazy. And now we can sit here and say this today, but back then we couldn't say that. Mm -hmm. But what we really started to realize, like Lake I shared with that story was, whenever, especially when you start something new like ministry, um, a business, a relationship, um, anything really, God will come in and he'll be able to go in and do that surgery like I had in that dream, how we both had in our dream, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. extract and pull out those things that you thought were, oh, I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man, old things are passed away, you know, I'm born again, you know? We just sing those songs like, you know, that's an Adam. And which is true, we are a new creation, all of that is true. Mm -hmm. However, there's some things that are deep down inside of you that are laying submerged, that you're like, oh, whatever, you know, I, I thought I forgave so-and-so, or I don't have a problem with depression anymore, or, you know, I'm not frustrated about not making it in life, or whatever it is. But these are the things that God wants to come into, and Jesus wants to come into, and go into that dirty bathroom. But we have to be open. We have to be vulnerable, like the word is today. Vulnerable enough to let him come in and do that process, do that surgery, and extract whatever those things are. Because if we didn't do it, we wouldn't be here on this stage right now, or even together. I tell you that much. We let him come in and pull it out. So I say to you, be like David in Psalm 26, 2. Allow him to go in, examine you, prove you, try your reins in your heart, and you will not regret it. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we're in the promised land, so just like when Joshua went into the promised land, you know, there's still battles to fight. There's still giants to mm -hmm. fight, so it's not all about being up in your pride and wanting to keep a good face as a Christian. If you're facing depression or any kind of mental problem, you know, just not only get prayed for, but speak to somebody. There's plenty of people within the church that are counselors, you know, that have the gift of wisdom and wise counsel and also. So, you know, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. That's amazing. Praise God. All righty. Wow. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Let us show our let us show our appreciation at least one more time here. You know, as a pastor, there's moments where you sit across the table from people in those situations. And for you all to offer something to say, because it doesn't only happen to pastors, right? It happens to all of us. People get in places where they're desperate and despair is heavy upon them. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. This is the most exciting time tonight. Announcements. <laughs> um, just want to say, wow, this is a good turnout considering we're on the wrong night. On a holiday weekend. So, God bless you. We're glad that God led you to this place tonight. Thanks for coming. This is uh, what we've been calling September to remember. Um, we've got coming up in two weeks um, the launch celebration for POW, POW, the Power of Words, which is the um, children's program that is being birthed here in Communion House to be spread all over the world is what the Lord is telling us, isn't it? So, power of words. Words are very powerful. God didn't think, let there be light. He didn't feel, <laughs> let there be light. We're driven in a world, in a culture where everything's so much about feelings, right? No, he spoke, let there be light. And there was light. So, for our children to learn the power of their words and hopefully bring that home and teach their parents the power of words of parents, blessings and curses over their children has lifelong effects. So we invite you to that. That's going to be kind of a barbecue 
picnic fun time. We're starting at 3 o'clock on the 14th. Um, we will surely break bread together and have communion, but we will not be in here for formal um, worship that night. We will be worshiping, I believe, outside or in the fellowship hall. Um, we'll be all wrapped up at 8 p.m. is what I'm told. So, um, Coming up this next week, we have um, House to House at Pastor Moses and Lady Rose's house um, on Tuesday. That's the third. Manuelita, uh, her ladies group that meets at her house, will be uh, skipping a week. So they will meet the next time on the 27th of September. They gather at 6.30 and begin um, their study at 7 p.m. They're coming up for the month of October on a new book study. Um, and the name of the book is Holiness, Truth, and the Presence of God. You might want to write that down, even you guys, because Manuelita um, endorses that book for anyone in any kind of leadership. It is uh, great material. So they're looking forward to that. We also have on the 11th, um, Tonya's um, meeting in Decula, also ladies only. And I asked Manuelita earlier if I could wear a dress and go to hers, and she said no. So, guys, you can't sneak into these. Um, that's pretty much it. Any other announcements we need to share for the rest of the group? All right. Um, I will say that uh, praise the Lord with the holiday weekend. We've been short on volunteers today, um, but we got it all done. God always provides. Um, please, if you're interested in helping out in the various ministries in the church, um, please see me. I'd be happy to sign you up. And now we will continue in worship with Pastor Moses. Thank you, Brother Lawrence. Uh, since I was the one who dragged this thing to the side, I'll help myself with it. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that greatly. And it's interesting that you would come up because I wanted to start by talking about you, Steve. Um, <laughs> Yeah, all good things, you know. I was going to talk about you because I saw you tonight and I remembered something that happened to me when I was about the age of um, 15, 16. Um, it was a time in my life wherein I was beginning to see more clearly into the things that I wanted to do. You know, I started to see more clearly into my love for computing and how I would love to be a consultant one day, going from corporation to corporation, uh, telling them of the love of Jesus by sharing with them solutions to their problems. And I was there, I was in a service at our church, and there was this apostle, I believe from Maryland, um, in the US, he came across the ocean, and he came to our church, and he got the microphone and he said, he said there is a young man here, about the age of 15, 16, he said, I think you're 16. Uh, no, he said, I think you're 15, but at the time, I think I just turned 16. So I was like, no, that's not gonna be me. So I didn't get up. And another boy who was just 15 jumped up very quickly. And when the boy came, he was like, young man, I admire your enthusiasm. He said, but it's not particularly you, but I will still pray for you. But then he looked in my direction where I was in the back. It was a church of about a thousand people. And you know, when you're a teenage boy, you want to sit in the back, right? So you can keep cracking jokes with your friends and not take anything serious. And so there I was, and I think on the day I actually had a pair of a new pair of shoes, so not only did I sit in the back, I had my legs crossed so that they can see that it was still new. Uh, so if you think I just started that a few weeks ago, no, I've always been like that. My new shoes, I don't take tags off my new shoes so that when I do this, you can see. And so, yeah, I know Terry's praying for me, it's okay. Others have been praying and I'm still like this, praise God. But on the day the man said, he looked in my direction and he says, he said, for some reason, you're not coming out. He said, but I know you're here. And this is what the Lord tells me about you. He said, there are things about your pastor. And he asked the pastor to come up. His name, the name of the pastor is Apostle George. He said, there are things about Apostle George that you desire. He said, and the Lord brought me here all the way from the United States to tell you that you have those things. And you know what? When he said that to me, when he said that, I was like, wow, definitely the guy's talking about me. But he got the age wrong. So I think I have the license to remain where I was. But then he said this, 
He said, I know for some reason, maybe because of your age and maybe because of the people standing next to you, you're not coming out. And those were the reasons why I didn't come out. He said, but I'm going to say this. The Lord says you have it. And you know what happened? I stood there. I received it. My brother was up front. He received it on my behalf. And when things took off for me in business, and my IT business took me from country to country, and consulting became what I wanted to do all day long, and forgot about the ministry. Do you know how God restored me back to the ministry? Two things. I married Rosemary. You see, you can't marry someone like Rosemary and not do the work of the ministry because when you think you want to go do other things, she will be reminding you, saying, what about what the Lord said? And secondly, I came to the United States of America at a time wherein I had tried kickstarting the call. And for people who have tried getting into their ministry and come against opposition and trying to crank it up again, you would know what I mean. I was trying to jump start the ministry again after being burnt in church and being hurt in ministry. Um, I came to the United States of America and all I wanted to do was just business, no ministry. Guess what happened? I was looking through my business email and I saw an invitation from a church on Pitchley Industrial Boulevard. And the church, the announcement was that Apostle George was coming to their church. And I told my wife, I said, look, this is an email account that I don't even check that much anymore. And how come I gave them this email when I visited that church? I wasn't even sure that I gave it to them. And at the end of the day, it all became apparent that it was all divine orchestration. Yeah. So I went to that church. My wife and I, we got there early. And for those people who know me, back then, I was never anywhere early. But that one, I was there so early, the meeting had not even started. And we sat up front and, you know, people were still setting up. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, I need you to get up and go outside. So when I got outside, I asked the people at the door if I could help them welcome people. Because I knew the Holy Spirit asked me to come out, but I didn't know why. And I didn't ask. I just stood outside looking pretty. And then after a while, I got tired of standing there because the service was actually about to start. People had come in. And it was all ongoing. And I was about to turn my back on my post and go back inside. And the Holy Spirit said to me, why did you come out? I said, because you told me to. He said, why are you going inside? I was like, because I feel like. He said, no, if I told you to come out, you need to stay until we're done here. It wasn't quite three minutes after he said that to me and I stood my ground that this limousine pulled up and Apostle George came down from that car. The Lord said to me, today you recover. I will never forget. Every effort that I had made at getting back in the ministry, I'd become frustrated to the point where I didn't even want to anymore because I was ashamed and afraid of the disappointment. And the Lord said to me, he said, today you recover. The guy was happy to see me. I ran toward him, gave him a hug, and then he stopped being happy to see me. Simply because of what the Holy Spirit said to me. The Holy Spirit said to me that you have taken back what's been yours the entire time. And the reason why that man stopped smiling was because virtue left him. And I tell you that story today. Because I know that there might be people who have seen things that God has for them. The things of their calling, the things of their election. However, the storms of life have blown and some of the reasons why you're not even right in the center of what God has for you is not the storms from the outside, it's the stubbornness from the inside. And you've thought at the end of the day, if I have tried so hard and, you know, persisted so much and still nothing is moving in the direction of the fulfillment of my calling, maybe that's not what God has for me. God just wants you to be at the right place at the right time and you will recover. From that moment, I recovered. That was the encounter that happened before I got plugged in to influence this church. And little by little, I started to serve from the parking lot till I got the microphone. From getting the microphone to sitting around the table in executive meetings. 
to becoming a pastor and part of the team that was planting churches in different places. I was, I was, I didn't just recover. You know what? God, in his faithfulness, made sure that every one of those things that I desired in the life of that man when I was in my teenage years, he fulfilled it. Recently, I had a conversation with my brother and I said to him, I said, do you know that this happened in Apostle George's life? This was the kind of house that he moved to at this stage. This was the kind of car that he was driving and his wife would do this and his children would do that. And I was telling my brother and I said, every single one of those things have happened in my life. When God has given you a word, folks, no matter what is going on in your world, nothing is more true than the word that God gives you. So I want to encourage you to hold on. Now, I got into the mind of saying that also because of you, Steve-O. I remember that when I first met you, no, 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 when I first met you, when I met you where Communion House started and you would come and visit, one of those occasions, the Lord said to me that he is a preacher of the word. You see, there is an evangelist in you, and once again tonight that I am reminded that you will preach the word. You sing good, but I think you will preach even better. You see, the man of God, Apostle Saints, I can tell you I do not remember a thing that he preached about on the day. But I remember that he singled me out of the crowd even though I didn't come out and told me that I would have everything that I desired in ministry. And for me, and I'm sure even for the guy, that, would, that was worth his while. And so it is worth my while here to stand today you will preach the word. To stand here and say that you will preach the word. I know you've gone through oppositions and still are going through things. But let me tell you something. If this is the reason why this army assembled here today to strengthen you, it is worth our while. It is worth our while. Praise God. Alrighty. Now let's see if we can say something a bit more cheerful now because everyone's looking so serious. <laughs> Oh yeah. Today I want to begin a series that I have titled The Power to Become. How many people have been enjoying the series on the Lord's Prayer? The series we've been having on Tuesdays. God is good. And um, since we started the series, I know there are people who have been there every week. And we've done four weeks now. And so I want to encourage you, uh, the series that I am beginning today, whether there is a holiday or not, I don't want you to miss any message in this series titled The Power to Become. Now, the very first episode within this series is a message that I have titled or that I would like to title The Power of Faith. So the power to become begins with the power to remain, which is the power of faith. And so if you want to write it down, you write it down as the power to remain. You see, no matter what it is that God has said that you will become, you will become. However, the ball will come into your court sometimes, wherein God wants to see whether you will remain. You know, the Bible says that the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for that man whose mind is stayed on him. God wants to see whether you will stay the cause. Whether you will stay the cause. And so... The power to remain is essentially of the fundamental step to becoming. If we don't remain, there is no way that we will become. <laughs> Let me say this again. If we do not remain, Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you and you will bear much fruit. The secret to bearing much fruit, the secret to not withering away, is to what? Is to remain. Remember in Psalms chapter 1, the Bible says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But this man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Verse 3 says, That man will be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of living waters who bears its fruits in its season 
and its leaves also shall not wither. The secret to, to being fruitful is to remain. Is to remain. Now let me tell you something. I, I have preached about Psalms chapter 1 before. And I talked about all of the oppositions that the Bible was describing there. All the temptations that will come. You know the ungodly will come. The scornful will come. And all of those things will come. But the Bible says in the midst of all of those things. You need to remain. And when you remain you will become. I want to say this very quickly before we read the text for the day and pray. In life. Especially in the life of a believer. It is not what you do that matters. It is what you become. It is who you are. What you do is your profession. But who you are is your identity. And there is no profession that qualifies for heaven's possession. It is your identity that allows you access to eternity. Remember the ones who came before the Lord at the throne, I mean, at the entrance to the kingdom of heaven, and they were boastful in their profession as being professional evangelists. And Jesus was like, no, I don't care. Because they did not have the identity of a loving Savior, of the loving Savior. And so I, I say all of that today because while I'm talking about the power to become, I don't want you to be applying, or I don't want you to think that the principles that I'm about to share are principles that you need to apply to the things that you do. These are principles that you apply to the person that you are to keep you in line to become the person that he is. And so before we go ahead to pray, I want us to read a scripture. Actually, I want us to read two scriptures. The very first one is from the book of Hosea, which in Hebrew I believe is called Hoshea. Hosea chapter 9 verse 10. And I'm going to see if I can um, open it because I want to actually read it, not quote it. Um, so the book of Hosea is in the Old Testament. If you're having trouble finding it, maybe you need to spend some more time reading the Old Testament. But for today and today only, you're allowed to just Google it. Now, see what it says? Oh, come on. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. And it's an amazing scripture. And this is what it says. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. Now let's keep our bookmark on Hosea chapter 9 and quickly run to Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 11. There are a couple of 11s that we're going to be looking at today, which also includes Hosea chapter 11. So keep your hand in Hosea because we're coming back there. But Mark chapter 11, I want to read to us a story. And this is a story that of what happened before the triumphal entry before Jesus went into Jerusalem and you know that the time that Jesus went to Jerusalem was around spring before summertime that's why we celebrate Easter because Passover is before our summertime and so Jesus went into Jerusalem at about springtime and this is what happened the Bible says in verse 12 of Mark 11 now, and I'm going to read a few verses, so please stay awake. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. <laughs> oh, Father, we thank you. The Bible says that the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because... There was nothing that was made that was made without your word. We thank you because with the right handle of your word, we have the right handle on our world. And so Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we open our hearts today to receive your word, let us receive your word delivered to us today with meekness in our hearts and let it mix with faith so that it can save our souls and do us good. 
Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that every heart that is parched in here today will receive fresh water from your word today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, Father Lord, for every seed that have been sown in righteousness today to be watered by the, by the rain of your word, that we might be fruitful because we are trees planted by you that you may be glorified. And so, Father, with Jesus' name, we thank you also because with your word, we are immune to the tyrants of the enemy. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, let your word find its place within our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, the reason why I read Mark chapter 11, verse 12, with a little bit of excitement is because of the fact that, you know, quite often we read some of the things that happened in the time of Jesus without necessarily paying attention to the meaning of the names of the places. And if you know anything about God, God cares about names. He pays attention to names. You look at almost everybody, every character in the Bible, their name has got something to do with the part that they played in the overall scheme of things. Even to the point where in God himself, who did not or who does not necessarily have to have a name, introduces himself several times with names, various names. I mean, to be quite frank with you, I don't need to have a name if I was the only man in this room and everybody else was a woman. Because it's very easy to say, oh, go talk to the man. You see, but because there are several men in here, you'd have to be specific and say, go talk to William. Or go talk to Ray. So that you can identify one from the other. Now, if God exists and the Bible says there is none besides him, then why does he have to have a name? And that was why when Moses asked, who do I say sent me? He could have said, oh, my name is Josiah. But then he said, I am who I am. <laughs> you see, because it's like, hey, what, what name are we talking about here? And every name that we call God by are names that help us to be able to receive and relate with him. Names that help you and I to be able to identify with the God who is the almighty, the all-sufficient God, the God that is beautiful for every situation. And so you call him that name at that time so that you can relate with an aspect of him that you can contain. Or at least an, an aspect of him that you can relate with. Because if you want to relate with God for all that he is, at any point in time, and at every point in time, to be honest, you and I do not have the mind for it. Even Moses on the mountain, when he had an encounter with God, he was like, ah, hey, look, you've been talking to me, but, but I want to see you. And God was like, I'm sure he must have looked around to the angels and said to them, does he even know what he's saying? You wanna, the Bible says no one sees God and lives. Because you, the very essence of your life cannot contain the expression of him. And so that's why he has a name. But see, the, the thing is, names are important. And I want to encourage you that when you're studying the word of God and you come upon a name, I want you to go take a look at it. Because the name of the place that Jesus and his disciples were coming out of was called Bethany. And Bethany means the house of poverty. People call it the house of figs. But in reality, the etymology of the word Bethany means the house of despair or the house of poverty. Now, why is that important? Because you see, when you, when you go through a dry spell in your life, as we typically go through, and you come out of that dry spell, you come out of that wilderness experience, you are hungry. When Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, the Bible says that he was hungry. And so when he came out of Bethany, what happened? Again, Jesus was hungry. But one thing that Jesus did that a lot of us have struggled with over time was that when he came out of Bethany, the Bible says that he proceeded forth toward where? Jerusalem. And if you know the geography of the time, between Bethany and Jerusalem is a place that is called Bethphage or Bethphage. 
You see, so he left the place that was called the house of poverty in its meaning, but in its interaction, people called it the house of figs. And he was hungry, and he was heading toward Jerusalem. And the Bible says that on his way out, he lifted up his eyes. I, want, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want us to read that place together. Why don't we go back to Mark chapter 11, and verse 13 says, And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. How many people have struggled with this passage of scriptures? I have. And I have been honest. I struggled for many years until recently. The Holy Spirit came to me. It was like, can we resolve this? I said, I'm sure we can. If you tell me what was really going on. Because all the commentaries that I had read up until that time, no one was able to help me to resolve Jesus' behavior. So he came to a fig tree, and the fig tree had no figs. And Jesus was angry. That was what we think. And he said, no one will eat of you ever again. But the Bible says, but it was not even the season. And so was Jesus being irrational? I don't think he was being irrational. I think he was just being God, and God is good. But the text, if you read the text, just for what it says, you're like, but Jesus, this is... Well, we're in spring and, and even the Bible says that the fig is the fruit of the summer harvest and so if this fruit is not expected until summer then why are you angry that it has no fruit let me show you something that will help you to understand because it helped me by the Holy Spirit to understand where Jesus was coming from now we are about to see something that happened here in the book of Isaiah. If you would turn in your Bible with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 28. The book of Isaiah chapter 28 holds such an amazing secret to helping us understand that Jesus was being good. He was not being irrational at all. Now, Isaiah chapter 28. Even I may have to Google it because I can't find it. Oh, there you go. Isaiah chapter 28. Let us read very quickly from verse 3. If I now read from verse 2 because I like it. He says, Behold the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand. What an introduction. This prophecy was talking about Jesus. And you know that Jesus... One of the things that he did when he cursed the tree was that he went into the temple. We don't have time to go into the details. And he pronounced that he was going to bring down the temple. And I say this because of the fact that I want you to recognize that of a truth, this scripture is talking about Jesus. Now, verse 4 says, and the glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is at the head of of the verdant valley like the fruit before the summer now listen the Bible says here that the beauty is in the fruit that comes before summer now this is the part of it that actually just completely blew me away the B part of Isaiah chapter 28 verse 4 the Bible says which an observer sees We just read in Mark chapter 11 verse 13 that Jesus was looking from afar. Who was the observer? Jesus was the observer. And he was observing and he had one expectation. The expectation that he had was that he will find the fruit that is called beautiful. Because it is the fruit that comes before summer. So let me say this. If you would, um, there are so many scriptures that describe the fig tree, but we don't have time to go into all of them today. There is another one in the book of Jeremiah that actually lets us know that a fig tree is a tree that has two seasons. 
The season that most people were familiar with is the season of harvest after summer, between the month of August, between the months of August and October. That is when the fig tree comes out. Now, I want to say two things about what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of being the observer. So what did he have? He had an expectation. The expectation that he had was that he would get something to eat. The Bible did not say that Jesus was looking for fig. Can I say that again? The Bible did not say that Jesus was looking for figs on the fig tree. The Bible says he was looking for something, just about anything that can feed the gleaner. Because also, we know that big Bible prophecy that Jesus is the one that comes to glean the fields of the Lord's harvest. And so he was coming and he was gleaning and he was just looking for something to eat. But then there was nothing. So what exactly was Jesus looking for? Jesus was looking for the first harvest, for the first fruits. Now the thing about the first fruits is that they are never harvested. They are left until the season comes. So the disciples were not expecting to find figs. And that was why when they saw Jesus cursing the tree, they marveled because in a way it was like, come on Lord, be reasonable. This is not the season. Is your expectation being guided by something else? Are you that hungry that you have not become angry? You see, that was what Jesus' behavior seemed like. And I'm taking my time to talk about this story because I want every one of us who's ever had any time to think about it, to be able to relate to the emotional disappointment that has come with that story from the first time you heard it. Because today, the axe is laid to the roots and the Lord wants to deal and heal. Our hearts. You see, several of us, we have sustained disappointment in God because we have called him the wicked master who wants to reap where he has not sown. Do you remember the parable of the talents? The guy who buried the one talent, he said, you are a wicked master who wants to reap where you have not sown. And so folks, if we do not know exactly what God has deposited on the inside of us that he is calling for, we will remain disappointed when we find that we're falling short of his expectation. So now let me quickly take us to Hebrews chapter 11. And I could have quoted the scripture, but I want you to read it and see that it is there in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says that faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I told you we're going to be reading a couple of 11s. All right? So what was the first one? Mark 11. Now the second one is Hebrews 11. Now come with me very quickly to Hosea 11, the same verse 1. And this is where it gets absolutely, totally, and almost unrealistically interesting. What God's been setting up for us. So let's go back to the book of Hosea. Chapter 11, verse 1. Look like Hosea just disappeared from my Bible for a moment. Now, this is what it says. Hosea 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt... I called my son. Let me just quickly say something here. When you have a fig tree, your expectation is that one day it will give you figs, right? When God planted human beings on the earth, 
His expectation is that one day we will become sons that will bear fruits. That was why Jesus told his disciples, he said, any tree that is planted by my father that refuses to bear fruits will be what? Will be uprooted. So we all know that the ultimate expectation of God is for you and I to become mature children, sons and daughters. Because until we become sons and daughters, we do not have access to all of the things that he provided. The Bible says, Jesus speaking of himself, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. He said, but I go to become the firstborn amongst many brethren. So when Jesus died and was raised as the firstborn son, you and I became what? Sons of God. Now I'm going somewhere with this sonship and victory relationship and I don't want you to fall asleep on me. Let's look at another scripture real quick. John chapter 1 verse 12. The Bible says for as many as have received him have we what? Given the power to be called the sons of God. For as many as have received him have we given the power to be called what? The sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. Ultimately, what God wants us to become is what? Sons. And on Tuesday, for the people that were there, you heard me talk about the fact that there was a maturity process for us that was serving the life of the apostles. At first, they were servants of God, as everybody was until Jesus came. And Jesus came and promoted them. He said to them, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. Why did he call them friends? Because he was the bridegroom and they were friends of the bridegroom. Right? But he didn't call them sons just yet. Why? Because they hadn't received the power. You can only become a son by the power. And we know the power is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, We have not received the spirit of bondage against the fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So we become sons by power. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you need to wait in Jerusalem until you have received power. Now, you look at the fig tree, when it's ready for harvest, it is called a fig. But before it is ready for harvest, there is something that it produces that is called a knob. K N O. K-N-O-P. You see, this knob is actually trees or flowers from the previous season that remains on the tree through winter. And when winter comes and it becomes very cold, the tree itself begins to produce flesh. And it actually looks like the human flesh. It wraps the flower in flesh. Now that flesh that it wraps it in is edible and that's what the Bible calls first fruits. Remember that we just read in the book of Isaiah that the observer, the one that looks from afar is coming and is expecting the first fruits. In Hosea chapter 9 verse 10 we read where God was talking about Israel as being what? The first fruits. So there is a first fruit which is also part of the season of the fig tree. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says what? Be instant in season and out of season. Folks, I want to say this to you. Quite often, we fail in our journey with God because we do not recognize our seasons. Before you become fruitful, before you become evidently a son of God by having the inheritance to show for it, before you have that which you believe God for, the observer is coming looking to see whether you recognize your first season. Amen. I'm going to say all of that again very slowly because I don't want you to miss it. I actually had a discussion with the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, you really want me to teach this on a Saturday? But we're going for it. You see, we read in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. Yeah. 
Now, in Romans chapter 8, I believe in verse 25, the Bible says the moment you see that which you were hoping for, it is no longer hope. It is promise fulfilled. In Mark chapter 16, when Jesus was living, he said to his disciples, he said, I am living. You need to wait to receive the promise. But where did he tell them to receive the promise? He said to them to go to Jerusalem to wait, but he was telling it to them where? In Bethany. The Bible says that Jesus took them yet again to Bethany. He took them to the place where it was very apparent that without the Holy Spirit, that they were nothing. He took them back to the place of despair so that they can appreciate the ministry of the Comforter. He took them to Bethany so that they can appreciate that he was the bread of life and without his spirit, they will be impoverished. He took them there because the moment he took them back to Bethany, guess what? They remembered the deprivation that the Lord himself experienced while he was amongst them. But the part of the story that I haven't told you and the reason why some people are now thinking, is this the point where I check my Facebook status or do I keep listening to this man? The part of it that we need to look at now, which I didn't tell you before and I was saving it, it was my little secret, is that we need to look at exactly what happened at the beginning of Mark 11. So let's go back to Mark 11. <laughs> you know, I told you that we're reading several 11s today. Hebrews 11 verse 1, we haven't even gotten into that, we just read it because I want it to be ringing in your spirit. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, we also read it, wherein the law says that when Israel was a child, what, what happens when Israel was a child? The Bible says the Lord took pleasure in him. <laughs> you see, every now and again, we tend to think about the fact that until we become like Jesus, the Lord has no pleasure in us. You know, the Bible says that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But do you know that even when Jesus was a child, the father was pleased in him? And that is the part of it that I want to share with us today, the beauty of being a child, because the power to remain remains in your understanding of the purpose of being a child. Now, just that will make sense in the next five minutes. Let's go back to Hebrews 11 verse 1. I mean, not Hebrews, Mark 11 verse 1. Mark 11 verse 1, the Bible says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. The place where they found the tree that had only leaves without figs was in Bethany, was in Bethphage. Now, have you asked yourself, what is the meaning of Beth, Fajib, or Fagib? Bethphage actually means the house of unripe figs. Literally, that's what it means. But in the context of Old Testament prophecy, Bethphage was the place of the first fruits. The place of the pre-season. You see, there is a season that comes before your fruitfulness. And that season has a name. The name of the season of your fruitfulness is called faithfulness. Let me say this again. You see, the disciples were confused simply because Jesus cursed a tree for not having born fruits. For lack of being fruitful, Jesus cursed it. No, he cursed it for lack of being faithful. You know why? The Bible says that Jesus saw the leaves and the leaves are not supposed to be there for any other reason other than to protect the fruit in the time of summer from all of that heat. And so you have all of the grace of God to shield your obedience, but you are not fulfilling. And that was why when Jesus saw the leaves, he expected that if these leaves are there, we, I made the leaves. Because the Bible says by him all things were made. And there was nothing made that was made without him. He made the leaves to protect the very first fruits because they were more tender. 
And that was why the Bible says that they were called the vintage, the beautiful vessels. And what is that thing, my brothers and sisters, that is so beautiful to God? Do you know the thing that God regards as beautiful? The thing that God is looking for that is, that is beautiful to God is what? Hebrews 11 one says that faith is the child of the son that you are going to become. It is the substance of the things that are hoped for. When you plant a fig tree, Ashley, what are you hoping for? You're hoping for figs. But there will never be figs if there are no knobs. And so when Jesus came and saw that there were no knobs, he knew that that season there will be no fruits. And that was why he said there will be no one ever to eat from you again because you have failed in your calling. So now let me say this again in the context of the fig tree. The nub is a substance of the fig that is hoped for. And it is symbolic of the faith in the heart of a believer. Now let me say something about faith. The kind of faith that God wants you to have is a childlike faith. So the child of the fig is the nub. Because the nub holds on to the tree through all the seasons just the way a child believes you know the faith of a child is a faith that does not care about all the opposition is a faith that does not anticipate anticipate the disappointment it is a faith that is there even when things get cold and so when Jesus comes the Bible says that the eye of the observer, who is the observer? The one whose eye is running to and fro upon the earth. He is not just seeking for the fruitful, he is seeking for the faithful. And so the power to remain is the power to be able to hang, to hang on to your faith and have your faith to show when the observer comes because the Lord is looking from afar. He's looking to see whether those leaves are actually covering something. Because if you're not protecting your faith, then what is the point of the scriptures that you quote? James chapter, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit said this to me very clearly. He said to me, he said, we curse the tree because of deception. The tree was operating in deception. It had leaves from afar, making you think that it's protecting the knots. The first fruits. But guess what? The reason why the apostles did, or the disciples did not regard what Jesus was doing nor understand it because they were walking by sight. They were not walking by faith. And anyone walking by sight does not believe it's harvest time until they see the figs. But Jesus is saying we're not waiting for the figs to conclude that we're fruitful. Once we see the faith, we know that we're fruitful. And that was why when Jesus looked and there was no there was no, there was no knobs just leaves he was like this is deception and we curse deception now you're wondering i am not a fake tree so how am i living in deception james chapter 1 verse 22 says it this way do not be hearers of the word only because the hearer of the word is what is a deceiver the bible says do not be hearers of the word only deceiving yourselves but be doers of the word and so when you hear the word, when you profess the word, and it's not mixed with faith in your heart, you're only showing the leaves. You do not have the knobs. And when your season comes and you do not have the knobs, guess what happened? You are found wanting. And when you are found wanting, you qualify for an expulsion. And I am preaching to grace believers here who say, oh, the grace of the Lord is enough for me. Oh, I guarantee you one thing, that grace will sustain you, but it is no substitute for, fruit, for faithfulness. No, it is no substitute for faithfulness. Because let me tell you something, what is grace? Grace is what? Divine enablement. It is the favor of God that enables you. But then, just imagine if you have all the enabling in the world, Sister Manuelita, if I come and I empower you by injecting some juice into your arm so that you can lift the chair and you're just sitting here all day just saying, I've got grace. And God is like, I know, I gave it to you. 
not lift the weight. Do something with it. And the way we do something to it is by what? Is by putting that faith to work. Folks, the power to remain, this tree did not remain simply because it had no faith. Jesus says, if you do not have faith, you will be uprooted. He said that to his disciples. When they came back from driving folks out of the temple, and on their way, what happened? The Bible says that the disciples are like, oh, 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 oh. come, come, come. Lord, look at the tree that you cursed. It is now dead. The Bible says that it dried to its very roots. And what was Jesus' response? Jesus said to them, if you have faith, will not be like that. It's there in your Bible. Shall we read it together? Let's see if we read it together so that you can know that the object of the story and the reason why Jesus took them through that experience is so that he can say to them. The Bible says in verse 20, now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. You will become what God wants you to become, which is the son of but before God can be confident that he will be, you will be a son that he will be pleased in, he has to see that you have that childlike faith because Hosea 11 chapter 1, 11, Hosea 11 verse 1 lets us know that the Lord delights in that child. He wants to see that you have that faith in your heart before you start moving mountains. Before Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead, he had faith enough to challenge the authority of the day because he was an authority that was walking backwards. He sat with them at the age of 12 and the Bible says for three days he held his own simply because the Bible lets us know that the child Jesus grew and was strong in spirit, having favor with God and with men. He had that favor which to us is grace, but the Bible lets us know that even as a child it was pleasing to God. And now you and I both know that the requirement for being pleasing to God as a child is to have faith. Because that is the substance of things hoped for. The observer is looking around, my friends, looking for the person to bless. The Lord has developed an appetite for faith in you because the moment the Lord comes, to, comes out of Bethany, the moment he comes out of that place of poverty and impoverishment, he develops an appetite that you can satisfy. And let me tell you the beauty of satisfying the appetite of the Lord. He then turns around and satisfies your appetite. Remember that tree, the Bible says that it's planted by the rivers of living waters, that best, it, that, the, the, planted by the rivers of living waters, bearing its fruit in its season. And the Bible says its leaves also shall not wither. The fig tree withered away simply because it did not bear the fruit for that season. So when you are going through, now let me say this, I didn't say this at the beginning, I forgot. But I'm going to say it now. In Mark chapter 11 verse 1, it's one of the very few occasions in scripture that the Bible describes that Jesus was between two places. <laughs> Jesus and his disciples, the Bible says they came, you read it in Mark 11 chapter, Mark 11 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to where? To Bethphage and Bethany. Can we please make up our minds here? Where is Jesus? Is he in Bethany or is he in Bethphage? The Bible says he came to Bethphage and also to Bethany. And these two towns are quite a few miles apart. Basically, the Bible was letting us know that the Lord himself was in transition. And when you are in transition, guess what? It is the time for you to have faith. You see, because when you don't have the faith in that season of transition, you will miss the elevation. A lot of us will miss our promotion. 
Because when we are between the place of poverty and despair and the place of faith, we complain about being hungry. We whine about not having. And the Bible says to him who has, more will be given. But the one who has none, even that which he has will be taken away from you. And so whenever you leave Bethany, please make sure that you have. And so folks, if you are going to remain until the showers of blessings come, you need to have faith. I am no longer confused about what Jesus did. Now I know. I know that that tree was living in deception and that was the reason why it was not allowed to remain. Now let me say this to you. Do you know that we read in Psalms chapter 1? <laughs> Let's read Psalms 1 again. To support James chapter 1 verse 22. And I'm going to bring this to a close. So Psalms chapter 1. Did we read it earlier or did I just quote it? I just read it. Okay. So we're just going to go straight to uh, Psalms chapter 1. Now. The Bible says in verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. Whatever he does prospers. This scripture is very similar to Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And that says, I will meditate upon this book of the law. It will not depart from my mouth day and night. And I will observe to do. Let me tell you something. You can meditate. You can quote. But until you do. You are what? In deception. And how do we do? We do by faith. The Bible says if you have faith. Then you must have works. Because faith without works is dead. In itself. And so the reason why this is important and the reason why I would love to close with this it is because the power to remain, folks, is the faith that is backed up by action. You see, because it's not just whatsoever you know, it is whatsoever you do. And what does the knob do? The knob holds on to the tree even when it gets cold. It holds on to the tree even when there are no leaves to protect it. It just holds on anyway. You see, because it is that kind of faith that will see you through to the season of fruitfulness. I want to encourage you folks, are you in transition? Are you on your way from, and what, let me give you an assignment if you're willing to take it on, alright, because I, I wish I could have gotten to that in my message today, but there's no time. I want you to go home and look at the position of Bethany and Bethphage. Bethany and Bethphage, they are actually sandwiched between Jerusalem and Jericho. Go and look into it. I am telling you, it is a good piece of food for the soul. When you understand why transition happens between Jerusalem and Jericho, then you will know exactly the way to access both the latter and the former reign. You know there was a victory at Jericho, but there was a victory that was pending at Jerusalem. <laughs> you see, the latter and the former came together because of a successful transition. I want you to go look into that. We don't have time today because my wife's about to ring the bell. But, one more thing that I'm going to share very quickly because I just remember that now and I think it will be a nice way to land this plane. And it's this. The Bible says, in fact, I think it's better that we read it together. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. You know why this is important, folks? 
There are times wherein you may not know that there is actually a season before summertime. You know that that was what the disciples did not know. And the Bible, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, allowed for the apostle to write that Jesus cursed the tree for not being fruitful, even though it wasn't the season. Huh. You see, if you're waiting until you understand all of your seasons, now there is a place for it. There is a grace to understand all of your seasons. It's called the spirit of the wisdom of the sons of Issachar. Because the Bible says that the sons of Issachar, they had an understanding of the signs of the times. But it takes growth and maturity to get to that place where your discernment is as sharp or sharp enough for you to know all of your seasons. But here is the deal. Paul was writing to Timothy. Timothy was a younger pastor than Paul. He was being groomed and mentored by Paul. And Paul knew that by that time, even though that was his second epistle and he was rounding it up, he knew that Timothy still may not have come to know the signs of all the seasons. And that was why he said to him, he said, do yourself a favor. Be instant in season and out of season. That word that was translated instant or that was translated be consistent is the word that originally in the heap in the Greek means simply to stand. And so here is the deal, folks. If I may miss my season because I do not have yet the maturity to understand that the knob is edible and is good. And not only is the knob edible and good, the Bible calls it a beautiful fruit. Because it's the fruit of the first season. And you know that the first fruit belongs to the Lord. Even though I do not have the maturity to understand it, the way that I will escape in the day of evil or escape in the day of ignorance is to make sure that I am always living by faith. Because when you live by faith, you will remain instant in season and out of season. And so the key to remaining I said, is faith, but the working of your faith is to actually use your faith as though your life depends on it. Because the just shall live by faith. Let me tell you something. There are times wherein you receive that which you have asked of the Lord. You see, Danny, you may have faith to receive a house. And the moment you have the house, you know what most people do? They drop the faith. But let me tell you something. The end of that miracle is the beginning of another. The end of that season is the beginning of another. There is no season that we have that ends. Have you ever imagined if summer ended and it took two months before fall? So what are we going to call those two months? We we'll, we'll call it living in Georgia. We used to call that living in England because sometimes in England we are just like, we don't even know what season we're in anymore. But then in reality, we know that as one season ends, another begins. Even though all of the signs of that season may not have become apparent, but by your faith, you know that the season has transitioned because you don't walk by sight. You see what I mean? You do not walk by sight. And that is the reason why it is very expedient for us to subscribe. Not just subscribe, but to abandon ourselves to a life of faith all the time. When I have faith, which is the substance of things that I'm hoping for. When that which I hope for gets delivered. Guess what? I still do not let go of my faith. I continue to do what the word of God says. And I'm going to leave you with this. I found a secret. To being consistent. I found the secret to being instant in season and out of season. I found the secret to making sure that no matter what happens, my faith is working. I found the secret and I want to share with you today. And the secret that I have found is a secret that guarantees that whenever the observer comes, he finds fruit. He finds something that secret 
I found through Apostle Paul when he was writing to Timothy. He said to him, preach the word. <laughs> Let me tell you this. If you are always mindful that your life is an epistle to be read of all men, guess what you will do? Lake, you will do the word. I'm not just talking about preaching with your mouth. I'm talking about preaching with your life. So when the Bible says, be not hearers only, but be doers. If you are constantly living as a model to other people, as an example of a believer, when you're broke, what do you do? You do the word. When you're weak, what do you do? You do the word. The Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. Let the poor say that I am rich. If you are constantly living your life as a model of what the word of God says, your faith will never be found wanting. That is the secret to becoming instant in season and out of season. So don't you be that believer that is always looking for somebody to run to. Be the believer that is equipped for others to run to. When you put yourself on that standard, guess what? It keeps your faith going all the time. Let me, say, let me tell you something. We are all human beings. If we don't have a demand placed on us, we can easily become so relaxed. Like, yeah, I'm not believing God for anything right now. I'm pretty good where I'm at. But guess what? I may be good where I'm at, but somebody's looking at me. And if they see me sitting around and faffing about, then guess what? I am being a bad example of a believer. Because to be an example of a good believer is to not be slothful in business. The Bible says, do not be slack in the business of the kingdom, but be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So I want to encourage you, preach the word. Live the word. Do the word. And by so doing, whenever the Lord comes, who is the great observer, he will always find something in you. The Lord lives on your faith. That's what he feeds on. Don't deprive him. Don't be without faith. God bless you. Praise God. I want to pray for somebody here today before I hand off to Brother Lawrence. And if you could just increase what you're playing there, which is amazing, I'll appreciate it. I want to pray for somebody here today who is saying, wow, what about those seasons that I have missed? What about those times that the Lord has come and I didn't have any knocks? What about now wherein I don't even think I have faith? Does that mean that I've completely forfeited my next season? I want to pray for you because the Lord has a word that he has deposited in my heart for you. And that word is from the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 28 that says all things work together for good. Yes. To those who love God and the called according to his purpose. Remember my story at the beginning wherein I had left behind the word that, that was supposed to embrace but the Lord kept it for me and I was able to recover. I want to say to you today that you may have missed your season. But the Lord, in his mercy, declares over you today a new beginning. He declares over you a new beginning, a beginning wherein your faith is immediately put to work by his grace. And so if you are in that category and you are saying, Brother Moses, I missed my season because I didn't think I had what it took. I missed my season because I had all the leaves, I had all of the things that looked like I was walking with him, whereas in my heart I wasn't feeding him with my faith. And now I choose repentance. I choose this new beginning. This is that grace that's been foretold that would allow for me to grow as I should. I want to pray with you. I want to say to you today, rise up and embrace that grace that causes everything to work together for your good. Even your missed seasons 
will be brought to you again. Let me tell you this. Jesus took the disciples back to the place where he cursed the tree. And that was when he told them of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, you and I can be replenished. By the Holy Spirit, we can discern our seasons. And by the Holy Spirit, our faiths can be activated. And so, if you want me to pray with you, I have but a few minutes, but I want to lay my hands on a few folk because I believe in the resurrection power. And I believe that even though you may not have been bearing fruits and you may have been withering or you may have even withered in some aspects of your life, dry bones live again. The resurrection power is the power of the Holy Spirit and is here with us in this life. Anybody who needs that crank, anybody who needs that restoration, particularly those who need restoration in ministry, I want to pray with you. If you would come right up, I want to pray with you. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Resurrection power flow through me. Let there be a restoration in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we knew in the mighty name of Jesus. Mara Bushuka Lamorobuski de Liana Mama Marana Skiki Lebo Gula Sushin de Lebo Baba. Woman of God, you are coming into a season that is spirit led like never before. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living waters because the Holy Spirit will stir you up from the inside. You will pray in tongues often. You will wake up praying in tongues. You will get in your car praying in tongues. You will come out of your car praying in tongues. Because this is that season to build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And as you do that, everything that you have lost, the Holy Spirit shows me a picture concerning this woman. You know, as believers, we are like electromagnets. You're not just naturally a magnet. You're a magnet when the Holy Spirit is moving all over you and moving through you. Then he allows for you to become a magnet to draw the grace and the mercy, the goodness and the mercy. You see, as you fire yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, things that you have left behind will come to you. The things that you have lost will be restored to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your divine orchestration because whom you did predestine, you called. And whom you called, you justified. And whom you justified, you glorified. It is by your guidance, by your leading, by your foreknowledge of this man and by your divine orchestration that you have brought him here today, that, Lord, you may restore him and that every withered branch Every withered tree will receive newness of life by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so I say to you, as Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Come forth. Awake unto righteousness. Come forth. Bear fruits. Come forth. Be faithful. Be consistent. Be instant in season and out of season. Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Because every disappointment that has held this woman back, every disappointment that has held this woman back, you see, I see you standing in a place and a woman was removing her things and putting it in a bag and leaving. And so the one that has left, that has left you disappointed, it is true that a woman left and left you disappointed. You see, some of those things, even when we think we have let go, the gap and the vacuum that was created is still there. And so every ounce of disappointment, discouragement, 
and helplessness that has filled the valley. I flush it out right now by the mercy of God. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as that one has left, let your grace come in to fill this man in the mighty name of Jesus. The day you overcome that incident, the day you overcome that episode, Hallelujah. the day you overcome that disappointment, and I say to you, in the mighty name of Jesus, that your heart receives in here today the grace to genuinely forgive and say that I forgive and I move on into the glory That which troubles them will trouble them no more. That which troubles them will trouble them no more. You see the woman that left you, she's looking for some man. Some man that she met before she met you who left her. And there's been this chase on the inside of her. And that which troubles her, the Lord empowers you to rebuke. So pray for her. And let that be the fruit of your repentance. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Uh, Father, your word says that in all our getting, that we need, we need to get understanding. I received this word this afternoon, Brother Jack, and I believe it is a word for you. And the word that I received is, we may have the wisdom to recognize what the purpose of the Lord is in our lives, but we need the understanding to know the time of our delivery. So right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for you that the spirit of understanding will saturate your heart and the timing for your actions will be precise and in step with the grace of God that is upon your life. And in this very moment, at this very moment, the Lord hears the cry of your heart and the longing of your soul for peace. Let your heart receive peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your heart be at peace. You know what I see is I see you sitting down and standing up, sitting down and standing up, sitting down and standing up. But the Lord just wants you to be still and you will see the salvation of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Be restored in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Is this your month? We've been praying for you for a couple of weeks and I know that the Lord has heard us. So today you come in here to receive the healing that we are called the name of Jesus for you. Right now, let the healing power of God saturate this woman. In the mighty name of Jesus, be made completely whole in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. You know what? I want you to open your hands like this, Sister Jenny. The Lord has written upon your hands the instruction for your ministry. What he wants you to do, how he wants you to do it. The clarity of it is already on the palm of your hands. And Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, whatever veils may have been in the way, this day they are removed completely. I want you to bring both hands to your face. If you can bring both hands to your face, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, nothing will get between the vision of this woman and the instruction that describes and details the fulfillment. Let your eyes be open. Let there be clarity. Father, in Jesus' name, you see, there is a testimony that you shared with me a couple of weeks ago. The Lord would have been announced over you today, and that testimony shall be made permanent. You will not regress. You will not lose victory over the enemy. You see, that which the Lord has given you victory over is yours to keep, is yours to grow by, it's yours to... See, the thing is, the bleeding has stopped of your strength, of your resources. And it doesn't have to continue again. And so, Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this victory will be a lasting victory. From here on, your son will build. Oh, yes. This is the time to build in wisdom, in understanding, 
and in righteousness. Even in the knowledge of God. It's time to go. Chris, let me pray for you. Where's Chris? Please come. I want to pray for you real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this man. I thank you because this is the season of the working of your grace in his life unto fruitfulness. Your fruitfulness will be made upon him. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, and it will come with honor. You will be honored in your calling. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I give you praise and thank you for this woman here. See, there are things that you know that the Lord has for you. And you have just been wondering when. When will these things be? Do you know what determines when? Faith. Because the Bible says now faith is. When there is faith, then it is now. And so I speak for your faith to rise. So no longer are you wondering when they will be. By faith you will declare that they are now. Even the fulfillment. He's told me that he will use you in the area of healing. And you want to learn. Faith says it is now. Have faith. Let your faith rise. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, by your Holy Spirit. Let there be a stirring, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Of the spoken word. Lord said to me that she will feel like a new person by the time she gets up. So I want to pray for you. When I was saying over that man that this is the season wherein he'll be honored in what he's doing, I also saw something that says that it's time for the laborer to receive his assignment. You see, there is more to you. And this is also you at the brink or at the gateway to that season of being able to find more opportunities to exercise and to fulfill your calling. And so, Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord has made room. The Lord has made room in his house. And that room is not just going to be occupied but that room is going to allow for you to be occupied in the mighty name of Jesus so Lord in Jesus name Lord let there be an opening up in the heart of this man to see that which you have placed before him and I declare over you that you will open up and you will receive the grace for this season say to you, be opened in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Father, I give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this woman. Lord, the spirit of understanding, let it come over her in the mighty name of Jesus. A new mind. Women, you have the mind of Christ. Anything that suggests otherwise is falsehood and let the truth reign over you. And you will also reign in the truth by grace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we give you praise. Have I prayed for you? Father, in Jesus' name. So you came out for the initial call, right? For restoration. But do you want something else in particular? Or do you just want to be prayed for? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord. You want us in communion with you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let this woman find those very steps to begin to commune with you. Father, in Jesus' name, because she needs to be able to hear, she needs to be able to see that which you have for her. And so, Lord, in Jesus' name, started in your relationship with God. Declare that you get started in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Father, in Jesus' name, we give you praise. God is good. Wow. Our time is fast spent, and I'm glad that we already did the announcements. Unless Brother Lawrence has anything else for us. Do you? Okay, God is good. And so please, if you, if you want to keep abreast of the announcements, follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. For the rest of this week, we're going to have the announcement as Facebook stories and Insta stories. Now, I want to encourage you. We don't have a prayer box at the end of the meeting for people to write prayer requests. We encourage people to ask for prayers right here to be prayed for. And so before you leave today, oh, thank you. Thank you. Why don't we do this very quickly? You know, the Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. And so, let us just make this a time of just bringing our tithes and offerings before the Lord. And so, I'm going to give you a minute very quickly to look on the screen. And then you see the various ways by which we can give. Um, if you want to give by text, if it's your first time giving by text, just send the word give, G-I-V-E, to that number, 678-929-2267. If you're writing a check... Make it payable to communion.house. And these people that are slain in the spirit, I don't want them to be deprived. So when they get up and you see them on their way out, give them an offering envelope. I want them to be blessed also. For it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so um, a lot of us have been giving now by using the church app. So if you haven't downloaded the church app, I want you to just go ahead and download the church center app. It's called the church center app. Just go Google it in your various app stores. And you can give by so doing. Um, also, we get notifications even during the week. People who have already scheduled their giving to go automatically. And the people who also give online via the website, convenient.house. Um, so, whatever category you fall into, whether you're preparing your offering now or you've already given, I want us to be able to say a blessing over the offerings. Um, so, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so to package your offering if you're registering, you can carry on doing that. And I'm also going to do my giving right here. And then in a minute or so, we will pray over the offerings. And then the host will come around to collect them. Awesome. All righty. So um, can we just um, go ahead and raise our phones? And if you if you have an envelope, raise your envelope as well. And let us just say a word over our offerings. Um, if you want to take a moment to just water your seed, say something into that offering. I call mine a servant on errand. thousandfold return in the mighty name of Jesus you may call yours thanksgiving you may call yours a seed of faith to say something with your own mouth what are your seed Father in Jesus name we thank you for every offering that's been given every tithe that has been brought every show of generosity I pray that every offering that has been raised up, that may have been given online, that has been given right now, be received as a sweet smelling sour before you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, a sweet smelling offering. And Lord, we thank you for communion house and thank you, Father, because this, the ground of this ministry is a fertile ground. And Lord, may we continue to empower others. May we continue to enjoy being empowered by others. May we continue to see the flow of your blessing amongst us. 